Good morning, everyone. So good to see you. My name is Jean Koo, and I am president of the LCNB board. And I want to thank each of you for being here this morning. The work of LCNB is not possible without your support, the passion, and the hard work of our advocates. Some of LCNB's greatest advocates are our board members. We are passionate about adult education and lifting up our immigrant neighbors, and we believe in the great work that LCNB does every day. I would like to take a moment to recognize my fellow board members of the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. Board members, would you please stand? And thank you for all our special guests for your kind words and inspiring words. And I'm looking forward to hearing our students speak later. Um, but we wanted to share a little bit more about LCNV. So our mission is to teach adults the basic skills of reading, writing, speaking, and understanding English so that they can access employment and educational opportunities and also more fully and equitably participate in the community. I joined the board of LCNB in 2016. I stayed not only because of such a relevant and meaningful mission, but because of the pe people behind it. The energy, enthusiasm, and the drive that permeates the staff, the board, and volunteers truly enables us to live our mission. The last two years has certainly made it very clear that LCNV students whose English is at the sixth grade level or below were in many cases disproportionately affected by the pandemic. They were and are retail and hospitality shift workers whose jobs were among the first to go down as things shut down. They were and are grocery workers and gas station attendants who put themselves in harm's way every day in customer facing jobs. Some had to leave jobs due to their children being home and they had to manage communications from their kids uh, schools about assignments, schedules, and generally figuring, figuring out how to navigate distance learning, which was hard, even if you knew English. <laughs> I can speak to that. <laughs> they were typically not those who could switch their work to remote in the way that many of us could. Many of them struggled to explain their symptoms to healthcare workers or understand vaccine updates. For these adults, literacy is a survival skill and their diligent work to improve their language skills directly increases their capacity to earn a living wage, care for their families, and become more active members of the community. Established in 1962 by a grassroots group of volunteers, LCNV is Virginia's largest and oldest nonprofit literacy organization. It is hard to believe we are 60 years old and I am proud to acknowledge that we have served nearly 60,000 learners in the past 60 years. And that's representing students from 90 countries and speaking 50 languages. So LCNV has recently been recognized through many awards, such as the 2021 Nonprofit Leadership Award, announced by Leadership Fairfax last month for our passion for service and positive change in Northern Virginia. Additionally, our very own executive director, Rupal Saran, was honored last night as one of the 2022 honorees for the Washington Business Journal's Diversity in Business Awards. She was recognized as a leader in her field and in the greater Washington business community. Our classes, with their focus on the language skills essential to the workplace, community involvement, and family life, are led by a highly trained instructional team, utilizing best teaching practices for English language learners. Last year, LCNV instruction touched the lives of nearly 1,500 adults attending classes from around the country and even around the world in nearly 100 classes. 
And those were offered both in person and virtually. As things have continued to open up, many students have expressed that the convenience of not having to worry about childcare and transportation has made them want to do, continue virtual classes. And so for now, virtual classes, in addition to in-person classes, are here to stay. For those that have been involved with us in the past, you know that each spring, LCNV invites students to write essays on a given topic and then publishes all student essays in a physical program book and invites a few to speak at the recognition ceremony in June. To mark our 60th anniversary, at each of your tables, you can read these learners' essays from over the years that include newly learned words that allow LCNV learners to confidently express their thoughts in English, sometimes for the first time and to the surprise of themselves and their families. We have watched our students receive standing ovations at these ceremonies, often with audience members and their own family members moved to tears at their description of how meaningful learning English with LCMB has been to them. Today, we want to reflect a bit on what we have been able to accomplish in the past 60 years. Paul Byrne is our speaker this morning. He has he has been a member of our board of directors and board of um, and board treasurer, sorry, on and off since 2007, and he has been a friend and supporter of LCNV uh, throughout. He has lent his expertise as a business owner and IT consultant to many LCNV operational and administrative projects. We are excited to invite him here this morning to share some of his reflections of LCNV's past. Please help me welcome Paul Byrne. Morning. I must say I was very flattered when Rupal asked me to, to do this um, and honored. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say was to talk about how I got involved in this. My first exposure to the Literacy Council uh, was several years ago at an event somewhat similar to this. It was a fundraiser um, over in Boston. And I think it might have even been called a taste for literacy at the time. It was various restaurants from the region that set up booths for food. And um, our friend Mark Tropy invited us to this event. And part of that was to listen to Patty Donnelly, who was at the time the executive director of this organization, talking about what this organization is all about. And listening to her passion and enthusiasm for what went on was uh, pretty infectious and uh, so we came away with a, a very nice feeling for this organization. Several months later Mark calls our house and says there's an opening on the board and he wanted to know if either of us might be willing to do that. Well at the time Sandra was, my wife Sandra was working and was traveling from our house in Alexandria to Gaithersburg. So her time was not really available, whereas I was an independent contractor and was pretty much in control of my schedule. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. I had never done anything like that. I didn't quite know what I was going to bring to this. Mark told me that it was only going to be like six or seven hours a month, too, which uh, I couldn't quite figure out how to do. I'm not sure he did either, actually. Uh, and it's, I've been there ever since. And part, one of the reasons that I stayed as long as I have, uh, is the people. Uh, Patty, as I mentioned, the executive director at the time, you just couldn't say no to her. You couldn't be around her without catching the bug for what this place is about. Um, one of the things I did do have to say, even though I was asked to talk about this for the 60th anniversary, I have not been on the board for 60 years. <laughs> um, it always seems like it sometimes. But what I did do is when I was I started thinking about this, and I would say, well, I'll just I'll just come up with some highlights, you know, the two or three highlights. And the more I thought of it, the more what kept coming into my mind was no particular highlight, but an overarching sense that for the whole time, the leadership of this organization, and that includes the board and the executive directors, 
and in particular the staff, every bit of it was people focused on committing to what was going on or committing to the quality of the programs, committing to making sure everything gets funded, you know, the whole thing. And that never varied in the 15 years. I've never, and the staff has turned over, the board obviously has turned over. I actually checked the other day and I've served on the board with 61 different people over that period of time. But there was never anything about, no debates about what, not, what was going on. Very often at the board meetings, we would have discussions of what more can we do? Are we serving everybody we need to serve? How do we know? Do we have the data? Uh, do, we, do we have enough money to do what we're going to do? If we have the money, are we spending it? And that just was throughout the whole period of time. That was, those were the discussions we had. One of the impressive things about the Literacy Council is how it's adapted. Uh, Congressman Con Conley mentioned earlier, um, in, when it was formed, it was uh, 1962. Most of the focus, in fact, the only focus was on people who had never learned to read. Uh, adults who just needed to have a tutor to get them to read, and that's what the need was at the time. And that was well served. But as time went on, 60s and 70s, uh, the demographics changed. And it became more and more a need to address the fact that there were foreign-born recent immigrants that needed to learn English. And then, so the organization shifted and started doing more of that. There was a period of time when the, both things were happening, a lot of one-on-one -on -one tutoring and a lot of classroom sessions. Um, today, I think virtually all of the students are foreign-born English learners. Um, we might do some tutoring. I'm not even sure we do that anymore. But um, it, the organization simply adapted to what was needed. And one of the best examples of that adaptability was several years ago, the idea for a program came up. Why don't we take these courses to work sites? You know, there are places where the workers, they're working all day, they can't really get away. And so this program was thought up. Um, we did some pilot testing programs. One of the pilot sites was the Goodwin House, which is a senior living facility. And it became obvious what the need was. There were people on staff who you would expect should be able to communicate with the, the residents, particularly in an emergency kind of situation. So this program evolved. We ended up taking people and actually doing the, the classes on site. And that evolved into the, the program called Destination Workforce. And in fact, that's part of the reason we're here. Uh, Double Tree by Hilton is one of the programs that you know, has participated and that has been a, a good partner for us. The other impressive thing is what's gone on over the last two years. Um, three years ago, we had this, this event, um, much smaller event that year, as I recall, but very successful. And we said, great, we'll do it again. And then 2020, we're all set to go. Three weeks before everything shuts down, can't do it. Well, I was amazed at how quickly and effectively the staff of the Literacy Council put together a virtual event. There were videos made, people could log on and, re and listen to the video students, speak, speakers, uh, staff. And we raised more money from that than we did the prior year at this in-person event. But you know, just that agility to be able to say, okay, we're gonna do something different, but we're gonna do it. But more than just the fundraising event, they had to do the same thing with the classes. You know, they had to say, okay, how are we gonna teach the students now? Well, they figured it out. I mean, I can't explain it because I don't do that, but uh, it was very impressive. And uh, they've kept it on the whole time. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm constantly, as I said earlier, I'm constantly amazed at the quality and expertise of the staff that is on exhibit all the time with this organization. You know, several uh, awards were mentioned. One of the, an older one back in 2013, the Literacy Council was one of five finalists for the uh, Washington Post Award for Excellence in Nonprofit Management. And for several years, the Literacy Council has been listed in the Catalog of Philanthropy, which is a catalog of respected 
uh, nonprofits. They take that very seriously. They actually go around and look at the organizations and analyze the finances and the management and everything else. So that's a good thing to have. If it's been mentioned several times about the uh, stories of what, how learning English affects the students, and I would absolutely recommend for you to take a look at some of those cards on the, on the table. Whenever I talk about the Literacy Council to somebody who doesn't know about it, I bring up several stories I remember from our annual recognition event that we have every year where the students who write those essays, some of them get up and read the essay to a large audience of 200 people sometimes. It's very impressive. And it out, it, you can't miss coming away from that realizing how life-changing it is. It is completely important. And you know, some of the, you, often you'll hear somebody say the best thing about it was I just passed the citizenship, citizenship test and I've registered to vote. And you, <laughs> yeah. And they say that with such pride. It's, it's just wonderful to see. The other thing I have to say in closing is there are two main reasons I've stayed so long. One of them is Patty Donnelly that I mentioned, who unfortunately is not here today, but the executive director when I joined the board. Um, as I say, you couldn't not be infected by the enthusiasm that she exhibited for what this organization was about. And that permeated through her staff as well, and it still does. She retired in 2017, and the board at the time thought, well, we need to honor Patty in some concrete way. So we decided to establish the Patricia M. Donnelly Merit Scholarship Award, which is awarded each year to a deserving student, you know, for their not just achievement, but their participation and their enthusiasm themselves within the, the student community. When Patty retired, I got involved in what probably is the one thing that stands out in my mind is uh, something I was really glad to be part of, which was the search for Patty's replacement. And uh, we ended up finding Rupal Saran, and I absolutely don't regret that one bit. Uh, we did such a good job making that selection. <laughs> Rupal brings the same passion and enthusiasm in her own style, not Patty's, uh, for, for what goes on. She fosters what has constantly been referred to as the culture of nice, which is the way the office and this whole organization works. And in several of the other awards that have just been mentioned that have been honoring Patty, uh, honoring Rupal very recently. So I have to say that Patty and Rupal are the primarily the reasons that I've been involved with this organization and will probably continue to be, even though I'm off the board again this year. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for being here and helping us celebrate this 60th anniversary.